Hi, everybody. So today uh, I will have a discussion with uh, two prominent, uh, two prominent um, people in the field of artificial intelligence for music with uh, Oded Bental and with Bob Sturm. But maybe I will give at the beginning, I will give uh, each of you like some, some couple of words to introduce yourself. Maybe let's start with Bob. Thank you, Sandris, for having me, uh, inviting me to be a part of this interview. Yes, my name is Bob Sturm. I'm originally from the United States, got my PhD there in 2009 from University of California, Santa Barbara in electrical and computer engineering, where I specialized in digital signal processing, but specifically applied to audio and music data. So I've always been interested in um, working with music data. Uh, actually, Oded and I met many years ago uh, 1998, I believe, when we were both at Stanford's at the Center for Research, uh, Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. And at that time, I was um, taking a, a master's degree in, in computer music technology and exploring this wonderful world. And then we uh, met again in London 10 years later, I believe, or more than 10 years later, um, and then caught up and then started down this very interesting path of artificial intelligence and music and composition. And here we are several years later in different countries, nonetheless, but still working together in these interesting I ideas. So I'm currently a associate professor in computer science at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm, and the principal investigator of a, um, a ERC consolidator grant titled Mosaic, Music at the Frontiers of uh, Artificial Creativity and Criticism, where we will be exploring over the next five years um, the impacts, present, uh, past, present, and future of artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc., on uh, music and how it's used and practiced and spoken about, etc. Maybe now it's uh, your time, Odin. Hello oh, and hello again, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me too. Uh, so Bob told one, some of the story already. Uh, I'm a composer, uh, and I have always been interested in uh, kind of experimenting with uh, different ideas and different technologies, which one of the reasons I went to Stanford, where I did my PhD. Um, and I still am interested in kind of tr always trying kind of new things and what is possible. And that's why um, uh, this collaboration uh, essentially uh, developed. And when Bob started, uh, implement implemented the first machine learning um, model, I think the, the, the important thing is that both Bob and I were a bit surprised by how good the results were not because they were particularly good, but that we didn't expect them to be worth anything. Uh, so in a sense, the threshold of success was very low, um, but it, it, it was surprising and got us kind of intrigued uh, about this potential. So um, this kind of aspect of working with machine learning is part of my composition uh, practice. I also do uh, other stuff, some of them related to uh, computers, some of them purely uh, pen and paper. Maybe you can shortly, right? Uh, very shortly, just uh, explain uh, what does it mean artificial intelligence, right? Or machine learning? The term artificial intelligence has been around for over 60 years. Um, what it means has been debated in, in countless, uh, you know, articles and forums, etc. Machine learning is a relatively uh, recent um, comer to the field of artificial intelligence. And essentially machine learning are methods for making machines, computers, learn from data. And that uh, experience of um, perhaps operating in the world and observing um, more and more data as it comes. Up. So classically, artificial intelligence is you know involved in making computers and and other non-living devices work as if they appear intelligent um you know not necessarily uh reducing the volume on your headset automatically 
um, you know, to, to, to preserve the health of your hearing, but more recommending books that you might enjoy reading based on what you've read before or recommending music, etc. In our case, it is um, providing uh, ideas for music or, um, you know, items of inspiration for uh, continuing to compose, etc. Um, you know, these tasks that typically require humans that are steeped in the knowledge of music to do um, and attempting to have machines do the same. Can you give um, some some use cases or examples where uh, already, right, artificial intelligence is used in, uh, in, in the field of music? One uh, typical everyday um, use of this technology is in, say, um, Shazam music identification service. This is uh, on the on the side of music intelligence. It's very low. It, it has no musical intelligence whatsoever. It's working with fingerprints of audio signals in order to identify what somebody is hearing in a, an environment that might be noisy. Another use is music recommendation, playlist generation, Spotify, Spotify for instance, Apple Music, these companies that are um, making accessible an enormous amount of recorded music to people on demand. Uh, YouTube also having, you know, uh, queuing up videos for watching as people, um, you know, watch particular videos, they would be interested in, um, you know, watching other videos. Of course, the, the aim of Spotify and of uh, these companies employing AI is to keep the user there so that they may see advertisements, et cetera, and have click-throughs on those advertisements. And, audit, and do you know some uh, some cases where it's uh, used in composing, in creating music? Yes, so um, I think first, uh, continuing from Bob's uh, point, I think it's interesting that we talk about uh, music AI uh, and we think, as you said, about composing, but actually a lot of the tasks that are already kind of are things that are kind of behind the scenes uh, that we are not really aware of that come into play. Uh, including, for example, I think some of the work that happened in the recording studio, particularly kind of cross-production, a lot of things that happen um, are can be kind of automated or semi-automated. But there are some, um, uh, 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 some artists, some recording artists, um, uh, who uh, worked with AI systems and there are some company like Amper Music and Iva are two companies who are kind of uh, making headway into this kind of and advertising themselves uh, as creating music using artificial intelligence or uh, creating music with some involvement of artificial intelligence. And uh, there are a fair number of people who are working in the kind of experimental side of music who are kind of testing uh, essentially what this uh, technology can do. Um, and uh, the system that Bob and I have been working with is working in the kind of symbolic level. So it kind of works with uh, generates notes. Uh, there are other systems that work to generate audio. So they learn from the audio and they generate uh, new audio. Uh, and there are various ways in which some composers are kind of working, starting to work with it. I think it's it's fairly early because the big change in, in machine learning happened in the last five years with the new deep learning uh, system that, that made kind of a big step change from uh, kind of earlier attempt with the uh, neural nets that were, uh, people experiment with that in terms of music, um, but the kind of big, big change was kind of in the last few years. Um, at least I saw some uh, some examples, right? Where 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 I would say, for at least from my understanding, is this um, m machine learning uh, examples in the music of composing or creating music is, is something which is very hardly to done in, in other means, right? Let, let's say one example I found out that there is, for example, there is a attempt to recreate how Frank Sinatra would sing um, 
Britney Spears song, right? So it's from two, 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 um, this two, two musicians are completely from different um, generations, right? So this is so this gives some kind of example what you can do with technology, uh, which is impossible uh, uh, to do without that. And and, and what else is I, I saw that there is some kind of attempts to to build it like. Um, uh, 24 7 or instant uh, music creating machine right some uh, some kind of uh, it was i think in you, you show me when somebody is playing the metal right and and it's ongoing process of creating music maybe you can give some some more precise some kind of examples of uh, how maybe these ideas not only work in let's say in more popular domains but more in experimental music as well um I think, as always, there is a lot of kind of interesting uh, work being done at IRCAM. Okay. Uh, in terms, uh, I think the kind of goal, and which I think is a really interesting goal, which a lot of people had was kind of an improvising between human and compose and computers. So uh, I think this is, is kind of ongoing and it's not quite all there yet, but it kind of they're making kind of really interesting progress. Um, and a lot of it is, is uh, uh, done with jazz musicians uh, where uh, the, they kind of have a shared kind of framework and they're kind of thinking it's, it's the more you think about it, it's a kind of a more, uh, the, the problem of the, 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 qu the question the problematic of it or kind of the, the challenge is kind of very uh, become aware you have to as an improviser you have to be aware both of the kind of instantaneous what you are playing yes. what the other player is playing how do you react to it and within a kind of larger framework of where you are in the piece um, and putting all this together um, is a very very big challenge but they're kind of making kind of really interesting work uh, which um, is um, uh, worth worth following and seeing what happened, um, and including some kind of fun things on the lines of what you said of Frank Sinatra and um, Britney Spears. I think they got three uh, singers. Uh, I don't remember the names, but uh, I think Edith Piaf is one of them, and um, not Maria Callas or something like that. Um, like a, so, a three singers from very different styles. None of them sang a specific song and they kind of did a, yes. uh, an audio visual rendition of them singing these songs. So these kind of style transfers uh, are things that the, uh, the current machine learning seems to be uh, good at doing eventually. And we saw that a few years ago in visual arts where you take two artists and you kind of Blend filter together. them one through the other. Um, so this is kind of one uh, interesting work. There are other uh, interesting work on kind of relate. I think, uh, uh, for example, one of our colleague, Jennifer Walsh, uh, Reese, like a, in the last year released an album that is based on kind of a collection of from music, Western music history that is filtered through a kind of audio, um, a lear, a lear, a machine learning that's based on audio and kind of traces of that and compiled into an, an album of music that she describes as kind of a, a maybe a kind of reworking or, or creatively rethinking uh, history of music. I would like to just add uh, one um, caveat to the idea that these things aren't possible without AI in, in machine learning. It's very possible for trained a trained musician to imitate a past musician. And so having a, a machine be able to do something like that is not in itself novel. For instance, you can find on YouTube some very trained pianists, uh, a creative pianist. What if Beethoven had composed the Emperor's March from Star Wars? Right. right? What if it was Bach who was creating a fugue on the theme of Harry Potter? And so these these uh, musicians, it's a, a degree of high musicianship to be able to improvise around existing themes within and between styles. What do you mind? Uh, what's your mind, right? How how how, how this uh, 
AI evolve or will change, let's say, experimental or academic field of music, right? So there is a different kind of scenarios, uh, what, what I have heard, not particularly in music, but in general, right, in society. So this one idea or one notion that there is like AI and machine learning, uh, which will replace humans, right? At least human, some kind of human, uh, human jobs. And, and then let's say in this way, right? In this perspective, it could be, that, let's say in 15 years, that, uh, there will be less and less composers and, and that this, uh, machines will start uh, do composer uh, thing, uh, and and it's very interesting what Odd Odd told uh, about uh, mach um, AI and machine learn learning as as musician who who simultaneously to respond to to live person right, so so that maybe there will be some kind of replacement of musicians right as well or second scenario or what we have heard a lot and as well as that, uh, that um, machine learning or an artificial intelligence will boost human creativity right so that so that we will do less uh, less routine work and it will help us to let's say to to be more creative uh, to, uh, than before what's uh, what is your feeling what will be future let's say in in year 2035 uh, I would say that in, in a sense, there, is, there will be a bit of both of what you described. So there'll be uh, some music related job that are currently done by humans, which will be automated and will not be, and we will not need to do them. Uh, on the other hand, there will be a lot of, a lot of kind of opportunities for uh, making music, manipulating sound, being creative in musical domains in ways that are now not possible. For example. Um, so te technology uh, disrupts and it is, and it disrupts including opening uh, opportunities and um, the, the, the kind of uh, simple analogy uh, for is, um, you know, turntabling that being a performer on vinyl records uh, and turntabling was not possible before vinyl records uh, were introduced, uh, but the vinyl records also uh, made some other um, uh, jobs probably redundant, right? You, you didn't need to invite a musician uh, to play in every part, you just could put on records. Um, so these things happen uh, at the same time. I think in terms of experimental music, the title is, the answer is in the title. Uh, experimental composers are interested in experimenting, um, and new te experimenting with new technology is part of that. And how, and um, and always. So, uh, I think the the um, and an issue and an interesting or important part of experimental music is not just taking technology and using it as it is intend was intended, but at finding ways of breaking it or subverting it or using it in a way that is not designed and finding what happens with that. And I think that's the kind of really interesting uh, things and will make predicting what will happen in 2035 totally impossible uh, because almost any statement you make about music, uh, a composer will come and tell you, you, will show you that you're wrong by doing something else. And I think that's the place where uh, kind of creative practice and the development of technology could really work together well. And, and it happened with the project with Bob that when I uh, uh, kind of sent to our system that is, was based on folk music, gave it a material that is very much unfolk-like, we discovered things about the system through subverting it. We described, uh, Bob eventually labeled it nefarious testing, sort of trying to uh, destroy the system. And then you find out its weaknesses and uh, things about how it operates. Bob, uh, what's your perspective for the year 2035? Yeah, I, you used a phrase called boost creativity. And I'm guilty of, of using that phrase as well and guilty of saying that this will augment the composer's tool belts 
and uh, other people have said it'll democratize music. But I would like to challenge the assumption that creativity needs boosting. Are we in a worldwide drought of creativity, right? Do we have a, a lack of creativity in music today that needs to be addressed? And with the, um, I mean, looking at the project with Oded that we've done over the past five years or six years, that data that we use comes from Irish traditional music, most of it, and of the dance type. And this is a tradition that's 100 years old, and it comes from far older traditions. Somebody that uh, was displeased with the work that we, we were doing asked a question that haunted me for a while. How is this going to help Irish traditional dance music? And after thinking about that for a while, I then came to the conclusion that um, if I were to answer that and say it's going to help it by so-and-so, then I'm sort of thinking of myself as somebody who could have a positive impact on Irish traditional music and admitting some sorts of, uh, of assumption that Irish traditional music needs help, right? I'm not practiced in the tradition as practiced as, as many of the, the players. When I went and attended a summer school in Ireland, I saw the amount of enthusiasm among very young players, many of whom played, you know, play their instrument better than I do. And I came to the conclusion that there's nothing I can do that would help this already. So for the year 2035, I think what we need to focus on are um, instilling in civil society a, 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 the truth that our lives need music and musicians need ways to support themselves to make uh, to keep making music that we thrive on. And we need to adjust our own um, uh, um, priorities in society to ensure that's going to happen. Working as a technologist today to build tools that I say are going to augment the tool belt is not going to have that big of an effect. It's going to impact my publication record. It's going to bring me funding, et cetera. But the bigger picture is a focus on reprioritizing music within education and within society as a whole. What maybe you want something to oppose or uh, to, to what Bob said or, or supplement? Uh, not exactly to oppose, but to, to build on that. A few, I think uh, some of the discussions that put um, uh, AI versus humans in, in this kind of creative domain uh, that uh, computers uh, are going to replace human musicians I think the 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 problem there or the there is, is that there is a quantity of inter, of creativity, uh, and uh, that's uh, the, the 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 interaction between the creativity that we program into computers and our own creativity is kind of an ongoing loop that uh, our uh, creativity is adaptable and changeable. Not in terms of we become more creative but we find creative ways. And the environment in which we operate affords us various creative opportunities and new technology affords new ones. So even if you kind of, the argument that is often made is that, okay, so maybe in five years time, uh, computer will be, computers will be able to generate hits. Uh, you know, today's top chart hits. Uh, and I think part of the answer to that is that today's chop top chart hits, if you can generate them instantly like that, will not be interesting to anyone in five years time if you can just click a button and get them. People will be interested in something else, in, in challenging that, in kind of something that they can't generate. So I think the kind of effort, the human effort, the inventiveness uh, that goes into making the music in relation to what everything else you, um, you hear, has an effect of how much you value, value it. And one of the things that will change is, uh, so uh, 100 years ago, people made this music by sitting at the piano or at their desk and writing notes and, and getting them printed. A lot of people make the music now by going into a computer and using Ableton or, or whatever um, to create beats and create sounds and post them on Bandcamp 
And in 10 years time, they will be using uh, AI informed systems uh, that allows them to do music in different ways and maybe publish the music in different ways as, as interactive apps or whatever, which we already have. So the way we consume music, the way we make music, uh, what we define as music will kind of evolve and develop but it doesn't mean that, uh, but our creativity will, will move with that. Yes, yes. Uh, from you both, I understand like as, as a main message, what you told uh, is that, uh, so we don't know whether it will replace human or not, but we, 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 may, we may be sure, right? That it will change the creative process of being composed, right? So, it's, so it will be, let's say more, Techno uh, using more technologies uh, than even before, right? More, let's say, data sets and more like machine learning or smarter algorithms than before. This is like the main message uh, regarding future for composers that, uh, that it will be necessarily like, uh, uh, that there will be changes how we create music, right? I think, um, it, uh, I think it's more about opening uh, new opportunities rather than closing existing opportunities. So you so, mean um, uh, these tools will, uh, will help, let's say, uh, to, to, to bring new people to the scene of experimental and, and academic music, right? Because there is an regarding uh, at least academic music is very like very strict and, and there's there is course it's 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 very let's say domain oriented so you need to, to have to, to have a lot of educational background right so so in order you can produce uh, uh, quality music so, so this is what you are saying that these tools will, will will bring opportunity for people without let's say such educational background to compose and to be part of this community well, the, the, um, your question is, is a bit complex in relation to the kind of what we expect of, of uh, a musician working at employed at university to teach. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't know if we want to go into all of that, but yes. there are people who already teach uh, kind of composers who are active in universities and are part of that, that didn't grow up in kind of notation based uh, system, but kind of came out of kind of popular music roots uh, and, you know, played in a band and then, but they were not happy with just, uh, you know, uh, playing guitar in a band and kind of became more interested in kind of experimental and challenging and kind of doing other stuff. And that led them to doing experimental music, uh, which is not, um, uh, which as a career, it's harder to be a freelance experimental composer than a freelance session musician. That's, uh, so, or, or uh, uh, this, or even kind of the, uh, the idea of kind of exploring experiment, uh, kind of experimenting with music would tied up with kind of intellectual pursuit of what does it mean? And then they led up into um, academic careers. Um, so the, there is a big question um, within education settings about uh, notation, the, the, the viability of notation-based tuition or, or pedagogy for the long term. Um, again, uh, if you take the historical perspective, uh, um, uh, 50 years ago, uh, everybody who studied music had to have notation. And that was a kind of fundamental aspect. Now we do see more and more, and, and not just recent years, but for you know, 15, 20 years at least, people coming into music higher education, uh, not through having studied piano or violin and not versed in notation, kind of maybe familiar with it, not very versed in it. And they are kind of doing it in different ways. And this kind of pedagogy of, of music teaching um, uh, maybe, maybe uh, is changing and maybe need to change further. And again, artificial intelligence might make a big difference there in the way we teach and what we teach. Uh, in terms of uh, how we make music, uh, I do think that there will be the notation, at least in the kind of next 20 years, I don't think will disappear. It kind of offers very uh, substantial uh, benefits, both in terms of conceptualizing music and in terms of transmitting music. 
and expertise that um, at least it will be a very great pity to, to lose it. And this relates to something that Bob um, and we mentioned earlier, this kind of style transfer that you can kind of blend to things. And Bob said that kind of this pastiche, this kind of copying or merging of style in something that humans are doing. And I think this is kind of, to me, one of the great challenges of this new technology is uh, being creative in, with music, first of all, means imagining yes. music, imagining what you want to hear. Um, and this kind of imagining Sinatra singing uh, um, uh, uh, Michael Jackson is something that we can all, can, we can, or, or a lot of us can think about, oh, that will be curious. But how do you imagine going way beyond that? How do you imagine truly something that is unimaginable by most people? And uh, the kind of mental capacity, and, and this in terms of mental capacity and training, and it, it is related to your musical training, whether this musical training is formal or informal, whether it involves notation or not. Uh, I think this will be the kind of really interesting challenge of kind of AI creative systems. How do they allow people to imagine and to implement what they imagine in interesting ways? beyond just trial and error of press a button here, press a button here until you find something interesting. Yes. So if I can add to that. Yes. I mean, I, uh, looking at the skill sets of composers today versus tomorrow, I think as more and more machine learning and AI is involved in music recommendation, you're going to see composers uh, and people making music in general, writing more and more music that is enjoyed by the machine. And in the sense I mean enjoyed by the machine, the machine starts to recommend that music more often than other kinds of music. Now, how you do that with uh, machine learning systems is actually quite easy, as long as you know the internal machinery and how brittle the knowledge is of music in that system, you can find ways to tweak your track such that it is going to be recommending your track over the most popular tracks, you know, uh, according to people's listening habits, it's because the machines aren't really listening to the music. They they can be distracted by uh, other um, kinds of um, information that may not even be audible. And we see this actually subverting uh, camera systems and surveillance systems by wearing a, a certain kind of makeup that makes your face even though humans can see your face in, in a photograph yes. the machine won't be able to detect your face anymore because of how you have applied makeup to your face or you've applied a certain kind of sticker or um wearing a certain kind of jacket that confuses the machine and all of a sudden you're you're invisible to the machine you can do the same thing with with music tracks so i think you're going to start to see more and more music that's enjoyed by the machine rather than enjoyed by humans, as long as there is a uh, more worth and value in these kinds of recommendation systems over people actually listening to your music. Yes, got it. So it would be like some kind of creative, creative, pro, uh, let's say, creative practices to hack uh, uh, machines, right? Yeah. Um, but what else? Uh, just uh, let's imagine uh, there is a young composer who, who just uh, finished uh, High school and uh, and uh, and started the first year in university, right? And uh, she or he plans uh, his future in in composing, right? In music. What kind of skills will be needed? So, uh, does she or he need, need, need to learn uh, coding, or needs to learn uh, some kind of? Uh, data and data analysis and data uh, uh, filtering data or what's needed in this new age of ai for music what kind of skills is needed will be needed oh dad what do you teach your students <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, i i think uh first of all there are the skills that are what won't change and primarily uh, they are about listening and consciously listening and critically listening. Uh, so being able to uh, understand or kind of analyze what you are listening 
uh, understand its components, uh, you know, the high frequencies, the low frequencies, how the uh, metric things work, or a non-metric, it doesn't have to be metric, but kind of time, time and frequency uh, decomposition uh, of the signal and what makes it engaging. And if you think uh, this is really uh, a cool moment to eventually uh, be able to, to understand why is it a cool moment? How does it relate to uh, other things? And how do I, uh, what can I learn from that to make my music more cool? Uh, and uh, all these skills are things that we have been teaching uh, musicians for a very long time. Uh, and we can, we, we, we will keep, and the kind of ways you teach it and the music you teach it through uh, can be very different and whether you teach it based on kind of listening to cello or listening to hard rock it, it, it is not the issue. Um, I think uh, some uh, familiarity as Bob was alluding to earlier uh, when the ecosystem you work in <coughs> sorry uh, when kind of technological infrastructure is kind of uh, underpinning a lot of the eco eco economics and the ecological system you are operating in, the more you understand how the technology works and what it does, uh, the better you are. Uh, programming skills are useful to uh, really uh, uh, train your mind in that, but, um, and maybe we'll have kind of easier uh, ways of acquiring programming skills, but I have some doubts about that. Uh, but we do see um, kind of a, a, like if we think about recommendation systems, for example, uh, uh, web pages or, or Facebook pages or whatever, kind of your online presence. There are a lot of kind of additional industry that developed about how to optimize your website to the um, search engine. Um, and this is kind of an arms race. And I think um, uh, the same would be with the kind of music you compose uh, and uh, recommendation systems. Um, and, and there will be a kind of a lot of kind of how-to guides about uh, what the recommendation systems are listening to or, or getting out of the data and how to optimize for your maximum exposure. Uh, we should say that this, uh, I, I don't think kind of experimental composers uh, will care a lot about that. Uh, just as experimental composers now are not optimizing the systems to top the charts, right? Mm -hmm. They're kind of concerned with other things. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think there will be, uh, in general, I do think that kind of more quantitative and um, uh, training for musicians and kind of not being afraid of numbers and being kind of more able to kind of get more out of computer systems is useful. Just as I think that the training to engineers to think critically and not just uh, uh, kind of think critically, uh, not just about problem solving, but about uh, what are the kind of outcomes of this and how uh, this affects uh, wider things and not just accepting um, uncritically uh, underlying assumptions. Uh, a lot of things that developed in kind of humanities um, uh, fields, uh, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, um, uh, should find their way back mm -hmm. into kind of scientific training. Um... I have one question. I have a lot of uh, French comp uh, composers, and uh, I just at least know very quite close friend, and uh, and for him at least, uh, he, he, he is for example, if he is commissioned like, let's say twelve minute, twelve uh, twelve minute piece, right? It, for him, it, it at least took four months to compose. So let's, um, what could be, let's say, value proposition for him, let's say, in, in seven or eight years? Can, can this technology somehow reduce for him time of composing, right? 
So, for example, can, can he, he will he will be a uh, will he uh, will be able to, to using these technologies to reduce, let's say, uh, the time what he spent on composing, right? At least by twenty five percent, let's say, instead of four months in, in three months. This is a future for already existing composer, or this is not a future, or it's like more like future, like uh, just for those who are, let's say, would be more, more in narrow domain of this AI and who will use this in creative ways of, of uh, in creative ways of creating some kind of new kind of music, right? It, could I? I'll start with a, a brief sort of um, highlight of a similar similar notions in the practices of the arts it's no surprise that the famous artists you know many famous artists in the the world in western art history have used apprentices in in helping shorten the time it takes to create their work so a recent example of that is jeff coons and in essence outsourcing much of the technical work and he's left to think about the big things as well as the marketing of his artwork. Um, Rodin had apprentices helping sculpt things. Now, AI and machine learning is and can be talked about as apprentices, but uh, affordable apprentices at that, right? And this brings up notions that, oh, we can democratize the practice of arts because it's now cheaper. Uh, it's accessible, but these apprentices are very limited in how they can work. Now, they're, they can be on 24-7. You can query your apprentice, your AI apprentice, uh, any time of day, never gets tired, spits out ideas, etc. But with that comes the, the need to sift through all of the material that's generated by the apprentice and say what is good, what is not, and it might end up being more of an impediment to uh, a person's um, deadline, meeting a person's deadline, than not. I would say it depends on the artist and what they're attempting to do, but I, I just want to highlight this idea of AI as an apprentice, but a relatively dumb uh, and unskilled apprentice. Um, regarding the your 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 uh, question. I think the the kind of work habits uh, and work processes of the, of composers vary tremendously. There's some composers who can work very fast, and some composers who, who work very slow. Uh, and it's not down to the the fast composers are better. Um, it re, it relates to kind of what is the the process. There are a lot of composers uh, for whom the kind of preliminary process of designing the piece. Uh, takes um, a, a lot of effort and most of the time and then the actual rendition of the final rendition is kind of um, like a final bits and puzzles. There are, there are other composers who take a longer period of kind of the whole thing. I mean, it really varies a lot. And so whether uh, an AI system will be of assistance to a composer really depends on their, uh, what are they searching for uh, and how they work, and can they integrate what is the technology is available into their workflow in a way that's effective rather than destructive. So I don't think there is a, um, uh, a, an easy answer uh, to that. Uh, as I said, I'm pretty sure that some composers, even in 20, 30 years time, will uh, know about AI and not care about it. Just as uh, you know, computer computer making music with computer sound, computer generating computer sound, has been around for 40, 50 years, and um, for uh, at least the last 30 years, uh, every composer who went through university training had at, at least tasted, at least got a kind of one course on computer music, and some of them said, "Yeah, that's great. This is where I want to continue working." Some of them said, "Interesting, but not for me." So, so it really is individual. Um, I have um, one provoking question because I have talked uh, with quite a lot of composers regarding AI in, in, in music. And uh, there is some kind of notion, right? Uh, that the uh, notion is that like, uh, at least it's shared by some people, right? 
uh, that AI and machine learning is very good on uh, reproducing things, right? But it's not pure, uh, but it cannot, these systems cannot cre create or using that systems, uh, we cannot create pure or uh, novel things. Is it true yeah. or not? Um, uh, uh, it's not true. Uh, but I think the, the issue here is uh, that we will, we as humans will tend to redefine what is real novel or real yeah. creativity yeah. Uh, in light of what computer does. I think in general, the, the, the situation is that right, we, we don't have a, a, a definition of what creativity means. And we don't really have a definition of, of novelty. So I think in a sense, uh, uh, I think the, the no, uh, intuitively we think of creative process as a bit mysterious. And this mystery is part of what uh, kind of, the fact that we don't understand how someone could have thought about this says, oh, so this is part of what makes it creative. So I think the moment a computer does something we will almost immediately redefine what the computer just did as not really creative and not really novel because we understand how it happened or, or someone understand how it could, could have been uh, done. It's kind of a series of uh, uh, simple steps. So, um, so I don't think it's true. I mean, we um, in, uh, and, and to give a kind of some example from our folk RNN system that uh, worked on, um, session music, Irish music, and uh, musicians we worked with made a kind of interesting remark that some of the patterns they found in the system were patterns that they um, did not encounter in any other song and did not, were kind of out of the, their repertoire of what are the patterns that are in this music, but worked within this yes. music. So in a sense, the computer stumbled on a bit of novelty within that repertoire a novelty recognized by an honest musician um uh, and and it's possible that i think other uh musicians or other people will say oh that's not really not really novel but that's a kind of argument about what novelty is rather than about uh our computers able to do yes. something interesting uh, for my understanding right uh, how i understand this uh, artificial intelligence in particular regarding music in the music field and creativity right I think this is like the way how you uh, it's usually right what here is uh, a little bit uh, bigger novelty right a bigger novelty is is it certain that there is like systematic approach how you use previously created data in in your creative process right so so you can do it in straight way you can do it in subverting way you can do it in creative way but i think uh, that's that's basically is that you using some kind of let's say you you using data on on something what is previously created right you, you can you, you and this data you can do in and you can as any like you can create different kind of of course data sets from that so that's why to my understanding is is that this is how we treat how we treat right uh, uh, how we treat that process right uh, do we like without AI? Do we do we see the composer? He's completely off. Uh, some kind of uh, historical process, right? Or or, or data, or let's say, uh, compositions created before him, or uh, or he or she somehow re relates to that, or use that. I think this is, uh, is the process uh, of here. Therefore, to my understanding, it's here is. It is it's just more structural. That's a more structural way how you deal with some kind of music history. But music history, it's it's your way how you you can define for what is music uh, history, right? What kind of data you take and or what kind of uh, com uh, uh, or what kind of um, maybe not only data or data set, but what kind of data you create from uh, from from history. Is it? Is it is this is the way how how we should look on 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 this specific uh, sp specific creative process of AI of AI for music? It's no, 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 is dealing with uh, historic datasets. 
I think if I may start, I, there's a always a danger in talking about these things to use terms that are pregnant with meaning and that mean different things to different people. There's also assumptions that need to be acknowledged, such as you know data and learning. Um, machine learning is powerful in the sense that it can discover things from lots of data. Um, but the creation of that data involves many different value judgments and always ends up as a representation that's completely impoverished from what it's uh, trying to um, describe. Music is much more than notes on a page. It's much more than tracks on a CD, sound that comes out of a, uh, a speaker. Um, it's an activity steeped in a context that's human with history, not only music history, um, but also a person's own listening history and their ability to listen in critical or non-critical ways. These machines that are working from data uh, are also severely limited in what they are, um, what they can comprehend or, or understand in that data. And um, I don't know how this relates to, to what you were saying, but I just wanted to caution that data is not just data, right? It is, it's a very limited representation of a phenomena that um, we're working at. And whether something is deemed creative or not, whether their output is novel in the sense that it hadn't been encountered before, maybe never saw or, or heard uh, the light of day on, on any instrument, um, we have to be careful with the language we're using. Yes, okay. Odin, maybe you wanna? Um, I think, okay, so, so my understanding of what you said is that we can do a kind of metaphor uh, it's kind of metaphorical thinking that um, we can think about ourselves as data processing units uh, in a way that is somewhat that at, at a kind of very basic level is analogous to uh, machines in that they have inputs of data, they process it, and they generate output. We uh, get an input of data, uh, we are uh, processed in various ways, and we use it. Uh, and, and all our um, creative outputs are informed by the data that we know. Uh, so, so at that level, yeah, you can say that there is a, a, um, uh, a potential analogy there. Uh, but I think this, uh, there is a limited um, efficacy to this uh, uh, metaphor in that the way uh, we work is uh, very, very different from from uh, the way computers work, uh, and and I think it, it comes down as uh, kind of Bob was saying, kind of the use of language. The, the term machine learning itself is in some ways misleading if you're uh, naive about this topic, because uh, because the, uh, what happened in the computer is complex uh, and. Uh, not really penetrable for us, unlike, uh, you know, a microwave, uh, we tend to ascribe, we tend to assume, or, or let me, let me restart and, and kind of say this, that uh, when, a, when we uh, use a machine learning system and it gave us some output and the output is, you know, somewhat has some traces that we've seen, yeah, a human could, could do it. And one of the things Bob and I did in, in part of our project is let's say, okay, we have a system that generates a lot of traditional tunes. Let's imagine that this is a composition student and I'm a composition teacher and treat it this way. It was a productive way of kind of thinking about it, but this kind of uh, thinking that because the computer generated human-like outputs, the computer did it in a human-like way yes. is totally wrong. And we could show it that the machine that machine learning the, the uh, system does learn something or extract some patterns but it's completely unrelated to what we call yeah. learning when we learn and that's where uh this so this metaphor has a kind of limited in a kind of very 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 broad sense 
you could say that composers are informed by um, a music they heard, uh, just like uh, um, AI system. Uh, no, just but but but, com but people are also informed by the conversation they have with people, yes. uh, the paintings they work, the movies yes. they show, yes. etc., uh, etc. Et when I said it, right? I just I don't know. Uh, to my mind, it came out, you know, this all postmodern um, uh, composing, right? So you, so what you do, you you took from you know, previously recognized or not recognized, right? Uh, compositions and, and you for, you use these compositions as a source from your uh, compositional practices. Of course, in AI and machine learning, there are similarities with that, but there are methods different, right? So in, uh... Yeah, I, I think the, the differences are uh, more interesting and more important than the similarities. I think the similarities are uh, kind of at the metaphorical level of of um, very very general things. Yes. Uh, and and I think it's uh, in, and also I think the differences are actually uh, more interesting in terms of thinking about creativity or or thinking about the use of the machines uh, because uh, computers are very good at doing things that we are very bad at. And I think this is the point where uh, it, can you, it could can be. Can you name the things uh, where, uh, where uh, machines uh, are good or better than we composers as humans? Can you just give example? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can think about, uh, I, I don't know if it's possible right now, but in the future, I mean, for example, if you are stuck at a certain point and you know, you have a bit of a block in your composition and you don't know uh, how to proceed, uh, one way I think I do, or and I, I just kind of okay. Imagine, let's try. What happened if I do this? What happened if I do that? What happened if I do that? Oh yeah, maybe. The, uh, I can imagine a system which, instead of kind of, is limited to finding three possible continuations, looks at looks at ten thousand, and selects uh, ten of them that might be the best, and present them to me. So it's kind of uh, uh, possibilities that are kind of my limited time and um, the layers of, if I think about one possible continuation, I already colored the next possible kind of limit by thinking. Uh, so for example, this is something uh, that is possible. Uh, I think there are others uh, at, the, uh, at the kind of, I mean, um, you know, I uh, the, some of my music, the one that ends up in notated scores, not all of my music, but a lot of it does. Uh, it's quite a tedious process to make the notation really clean in this. And if I could just tell the computer here, here are my sketches, read them, make them into good notation, I'll be very happy. Bob, can you just uh, tell me what is uh, quality criteria for good AI music? What is the qualitative criteria? Yeah, quality. Yes. How we can distinguish bad uh, AI music from, from good music? Is it the, like universal criteria for any music, or are there or are there very specific evaluation criteria? Um, that's not within my field of expertise whatsoever. However, I can say from the point of view of a, a machine. And the system that I developed that won uh, at the AI Music Generation Challenge 2020, where four human judges uh, gave first prize to a, a piece generated by my machine that involved not only folk RNN as the generator, but also involved an artificial critic selecting from the material that was generated by the system to say, that uh, which is good, which is bad. The criteria that I developed for the decision machinery of that system involved um, a, a quantitative analysis of 365 existing um, tunes that I called and, and well assumed good because they're published. They're recognized 100 years plus ago and many of them are still in performance today. Those um, quantitative 
um, decisions translating to any kind of useful human um, qualitative reasons for selecting tunes is it's not clear you know what those uh, relate however the judges in their capacity and knowing about the music and the tradition in which they they work and teach and play in um, and they knew that they were judging transcriptions or tunes generated by computers were impressed by the um, the outcome of that system and it's it's it was a random selection I selected five tunes out of 10,000 from each of the seven submissions uh, in the competition and so it was a happy accident but it's still just an accident that this tune was was um, you know awarded first prize Odell, maybe you want something to add on what's good? Well, um, I think uh, good and bad music, um, it's, not a universal, it's not a universal thing. Uh, music cultures vary uh, so dramatically around the globe um, that there are no universal criteria and there are uh, cultural norms that you uh, learn uh, and there are personal preferences and there are the mood you're in or the need at the moment. Uh, there are kind of the peer group of, you know, the, uh, uh, your identity is partly defined by the music you like um, and therefore the music you think is good. Uh, so I think just as we don't have criteria uh, for uh, good music, we don't have criteria for good AI music, and we we're not going to to have that uh, very easily. Uh, we might be able to uh, um, optimize uh, commercial success, eventually. Uh, or uh, again, I, I don't think we're going to be a, a, a full like uh, a system that generates that every piece. It generates is always going to be successful. I don't believe that is very uh, nearly uh, possible, but it's it is possible that uh, within this kind of new evolving uh, situation, uh, we will be able some companies will be able to optimize the revenue based on um, AI. In the last question, both of you, so maybe you can give. Uh... Uh, one or two examples each of uh, of how um, composers uh, use AI systems in creative and subvertive way, right? To create, let's say, more experimental music. I, I can I can talk about my own uh, yes, because yes, that's yes, the yes, one yes. I really know. Um, so I wrote three pieces. Uh, using um, uh, machine learning systems. Um, and in, in all these cases, uh, my interest was to contend with, uh, to have to deal with material that is not me. Um, and, and it was a kind of interesting challenge to stretch myself to accommodate uh, something else. And it was also an opportunity to learn about uh, other music. I think, for example, um, I'll talk briefly. I mean, we talked last week about another piece. I'll talk about a piece that I wrote with our folk and piece, uh, music uh, system called, um, the piece is called Between the Lines. And we retrained the system on uh, English Renaissance vocal music, uh, particularly the work of Talis. Um, and uh, we generated, so our system at that point and still is generates single melodies. And we suddenly wanted to put it on, on, on a style of music where the relationship between the voices are really crucial. And looking at the output of the system, it was clear that this is simply not there and not possible to, that it will be there. And it, in that sense, uh, it, in relation to English, English polyphony, Renaissance belief in it was a complete failure. 
Uh, but nevertheless, I uh, uh, found a kind of interesting way of uh, impo of bringing some of that attributes of English polyphony through my own creativity into a piece which has kind of uh, repeated lines that are kind of sliding against each other. The lines are generated by the system and have some echoes of that Renaissance music. Uh, but the, the, the interesting bits about this piece is about this repertoire were completely not encoded into the system. Um, so this was kind of a failure of the system that led me to do something that I'm uh, really happy with and kind of interesting result. Uh, so, so that's kind of, for example, one uh, example. I would also, I would give uh, direction uh, or I would tell people Go listen to the work of uh, Oded and listen to the work of Jennifer Walsh and Holly Herndon, who are uh, experimenting in sort of real time with the use of AI and machine learning within their own practice. Thank you very much for this interview. And uh, it was nice pleasure to have you here and, and, and discuss future Thank you. music. So, Thank you for inviting us.